right, everyone, thank you for joining. The dedications for today. Um, tonight's class was sponsored by Mrs. Gittim Units. This is in honor of her mother's yard site. Leia Bas Rabbi Yaakov, Olav HaShalom, Chav Ches Oder Aleph. May her neshama have a great aliyah, which is tonight. May her neshama have a great aliyah to the greatest of heights. We should see her already here, where she belongs, where everybody belongs. Take her from a Yad Mamish. Um, and much, much while she's coming back here, she should help generate extra brachas to you and to the entire mishpacha. From much mazel bracha and only, only good things. Um, tonight's class was also sponsored by Terry Levin. And this is in honor of her grandmother, whose uh, yard site was today, Fege Bas Shmuel. And then for her grandfather, whose yard site is on the first of Adar Beis, that is um, on Friday, Yisrael Ben Shmuel Yecheskel Halevi. And uh, for an aunt, whose Lin Bas Avraham, whose yard site is going to be the third of Adar Beis. May Hashem give them all an alias neshama to the greatest of heights. And much, much bracha to you for all that you need. And Yamala Hashem ko meshalis libcha. For real. And everything that you're asking and all that you want and all that you need should be completely fulfilled in a way that's tangible. And thank you for the dedication. And Be'ezus Hashem, we should already celebrate the ultimate celebration. All right. This week is a special Shabbos. It's a special week. It's a special Shabbos. It's Shabbos Parshas Pekude, which makes it Shabbos Chazak, because we're finishing Sefer, Sefer Shemois. Um, and it's Shabbos already in Adar Sheni, the second Adar, Mishnah Bas Adar, Marben Basimcha. It's good. It's good times. We're living in really, really, really good, exciting times. Um, so let's find something something inspirational in the parsha. So in Parsha's Pekude, is, the Torah tells us about completing the project that we've been busy with the last few weeks. We have been busy with the Mishkan every week. We started Parsha's Truma and then Tetzave and Kisisa and Vayakel and so forth. And the project now comes to its conclusion. The last chapter in Parshas Pekude, let me see, make sure it is the last chapter, yeah? Perek Mem, the last chapter in Sefer Shemois, chapter 40, begins with the instructions that the Eberster gives to Moshe Rabbeinu for the final erection of the Mishka, of when it should be done and how it should be done. So the Eberster tells Moshe Rabbeinu, Hashem speaks to Moshe saying, on the first day of the first month, that's Aleph Nisan. Okay, that's a little over a month. You should put up the Mishkan. And then Hashem gives detailed instructions about putting up the Mishkan, how it should be put up. The Samta Hashem says, you should, and then you're going to put into the Mishkan the Aron, and you're going to cover over the, over the uh, uh, you're going to protect the Aron, you're going to shield the Aron with the parochas, which is the partition that goes between the Holy of Holies and the Holies. And then Hashem says you should bring the table, the shulchan of the showbread. Varach des erkon, you should arrange its arrangements. And then you should bring the menorah in. Ve'aleisas nei and you should um, kindle the menorah. And then he says, you should put the... So, so we started with the most inner, inner sanctuary, the Kodesh HaKadashim, where we put the Aron, then you put the partition, then we're in the outer room, so we're working our way from in, out. And then we come into the outer room, we put the, um, the Shulchan, with the showbread, and Hashem says to Moshe, put the Shulchan and put the lechem upon him on it, put the menorah and light its lamps, put the mizbeach, this is the small 
mizbeach, mizbeach apnimi, mizbeach azov, the gold mizbeach. And um, here it doesn't say that he should offer the 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 um, incense. It doesn't say that, but it says you should put the mizbeach. Then he says you should put the partition. Then in the courtyard, you should put mizbeach oila, the mizbeach of the ola in front of the Pesach Mishkan Oyel Moed, in front of the entrance to the Mishkan, now that you're in the courtyard, you put the big altar. This is the one where all the sacrifices were on. Then you should put the key or the wash basin between the Ohel Moed, between the tent and the Mizbeach, that's where the, where the wash basin was, and you should put water inside of it. And then Hashem says, you should place the courtyard around. You should place the courtyard around and you should put the masach, which is the, the, sh, um, the screen which serves as the, the entrance way to block or to, in the entrance way to the courtyard, you have a special partition. Fine. Then you should go and anoint everything and everything will become holy. So, Nachmanides, Ramban, when he's reading the Chumash, has a problem. If you take these words literally, as it is stated, here's your problem. It says that you should put the showbreads on the table immediately. You should put the menorah, light them, and light the menorah. And the first problem Ramban has, you didn't even anoint it yet. In the next Pasuk, it says you should go and anoint all the Kalim. Before they were anointed, they were unholy. And if they're not holy, how, what's the significance of lighting a menorah that's just a regular candelabra? That's his question. And the further, it says you should put the Mizbeach outside, and you should offer on it, that's what he says, you should put the Mizbeach, Oh, hold it. It says you should offer. What does it say you should offer the... It says somewhere... I'm sorry. I was mistaking. I was reading with Hashem's instructions. In chapter 40, a little later... Not in Hashem's instructions. Verse 17, Pasuk Yud Zion, it's talking how Moshe Rabbeinu actually did it. That's what I was left. Some, something wasn't, uh, I was on the wrong page. That happens to you, you're on the wrong page. But not when you're giving a lecture, right? It's no good. But let me tell you, now I'm on the right page, hopefully. What happens? He tells him, Moshe Rabbeinu puts up the Mishkan. So it says that Moshe Rabbeinu put up the Mishkan and the ohel and all the tents and all the tapestries and the whole, the whole situation. After he puts up the whole mishkan, it says he went and he put, Moshe took the luchos and he puts them in the aron and he puts the poles in the aron, the aron is the ark, he puts the poles in them. Then he puts the cover, the kaporas on it. Then he, he takes the aron and he brings it into the inner sanctuary good. And after that, it says he puts the partition. Fine. As I told you earlier. Then it says he puts the shulchan. And it says immediately that Moshe Rabbeinu put the showbreads on. Then he goes and he puts the menorah. And he lights the lamps. Then uh, it says he puts the, miz, the mizbeach. And here it actually does say, I knew something was wrong. I was telling you, I was looking for it. Here it says he puts that little altar. And it says immediately he burns the katoras, the spices, the, the, the incense. And then it says, he puts the partition. Now he's standing outside, because he, he, he laid the partition out in front of him. He's outside. He puts the mezbeach, the big altar. And on the altar, he offers the ola, the mincha, and the mincha like Hashem commanded. Then he puts the key or the wash basin. And it will be used for Moshe, Aaron, and his sons to wash their hands. And then, it, and afterwards, it says he puts the he puts up the, the the courtyard, the fence that goes all around. 
which was made through a certain kind of material, like a lacing. Like you ever see a tablecloth lacing, lace, lace material? That's what the walls were made out of, like a laced material that went around, held up by pillars. But that went after everything. So going back to Nachmanides. Nachmanides says, there's a problem over here. You can't say that this is literally, the Torah is telling you actually what happened, how it happened. Because then you have a serious problem. Number one, um, he was only commanded that he should anoint them all afterwards. That's number one. But the other question we have is, how can it be that Moshe Rabbeinu puts the Mizbeach and he immediately offers an Ola and a Mincha on the Mizbeach? The Mizbeach is supposed to be in a courtyard. He hasn't yet put up the courtyard. If there's no courtyard, if there's no fence, then it's not a courtyard. Then it's just a plain desert land. This is not, this place is not even cordoned. What is it called? Cordoned? Cordoned? Yeah, it's not, it's not segregated to be, to be Mishkan. It's just uh, an open space. So he would have to put first the, the wall and after that, so the Ramban says, yes, you have to read a little stronger into the verses. It doesn't mean that he did all these things immediately. He didn't. When Moshe Rabbeinu came in and he put the, he put the vessels, each one on its place, he didn't immediately put the showbreads. He didn't immediately light the menorah. He didn't immediately do the, the, the ketores. Because as we said earlier, it had to first be anointed. He had other things to do. And the whole Mishkan had to be set up. And when it says by the Mizbeach that Moshe Rabbeinu put the, ar the altar and offered right away, it doesn't mean that. He first poured the partition. It's only saying what he was going to do afterwards. After everything was put into place, Moshe Rabbeinu went and did all these things for the first time. Later, Moshe Rabbeinu did not work in the Mishkan. It was Aaron's job. But on the first day, on the eighth day when he put up the Mishkan, this is the eighth day because they... We're soon going to see that for seven days they put him up every day, took him down. But on Chodesh Nisan, he put him up permanently. So on this day, Moshe Rabbeinu did all those things, but he did them only after the Mishkan was complete. That is what Nachmanides says, what Ramban says. Problem is, when you learn Rashi, um, you would think that Rashi wouldn't let something like this slip by without commenting. Now, if Rashi was also of the opinion of Ramban, that Moshe Rabbeinu did not do them immediately like the Psukim are saying, and he only did it later, then I think that something, of course, that what? That Rashi should have noticed. Rashi should have said something. He's changing the whole meaning of these Psukim. Since Rashi doesn't say anything and he's silent about it, it seems very clear that Rashi is of the opinion that whatever it says that happened, that's what happened. That's what took place. That's exactly the order that it was done. And that would mean that Moshe Rabbeinu immediately, even though there was no menorah in the room, there was no, he immediately he put, he put the shulchan and he immediately piled them up with the breads. He put the menorah, he immediately lit the menorah. He put the altar, even though there is no walls, there's no clay. Uh, he, he offered the carbon immediately. Which obviously needs explanation, because we know according to halacha, that doesn't work. Because according to halacha, when there is no kloim, when there is no walls fenced around the mishkan, then the mishkan is not considered a mishkan. And if it's not considered a mishkan yet, you can't offer any carbon there. So we would have to understand what's Rashi's reasoning, okay? So even though I'm going to be a little bit technical, halakhically, a little bit in the beginning, we're going to come to a very exciting uh, teaching, what this is going to lead to. So bear with me. The possible explanation that there is to explain the argument with, between Ramban and Rashi regarding if Moshe Rabbeinu on the first day did everything, uh, waited till the Mishkan was complete and only after that officiated? Or Moshe Rabbeinu officiated and did the services in the temple, in each keli, in each vessel, as soon as it was put into the Mishkan? The argument between Rashi and the Ramban could be explained as follows. We find another, another 
um, a difference between the two of them regarding the significance of the seven day period that preceded the eighth day. See, the day that Moshe Rabbeinu was instructed, the first day of Nisan, to put up the Mishkan, even though in our Pasuk it implies that this was the first day, Hashem is instructing, put it up, we know that that's not the case. Because we are familiar with the concept called Shivas Yemei Hamaluyim, which we're actually in the Shivas Yemei Hamaluyim right now, if this would be a regular Adar. Now that we're, so, but in some sense it is, because Adar repeats itself twice. The seven days of filling are the last seven days in a month of Adar. Seven days preceding Nisan. What happened? Those seven days, Hashem instructed Moshe Rabbeinu that Aaron and his sons should do certain, which would offer certain sacrifices to kind of ease them in into the service, to make them holy. And it was a seven day kind of drill. It was a seven day drill. There were specific sacrifices that needed to be done during those days. We know that during those seven days, we know that during those seven days, um, we know that during those seven days, Moshe Rabbeinu put up the Mishkan every day and disassembled it. Assembled it and disassembled it at night, in the evening. Put it up and put it down. Take it up. The question is, how do we characterize those seven days? What was the content of Moshe putting it up during those seven days? And how is it different the eighth day? Because we, when we're learning this pasuk, it, it, one can question. It's as if Hashem is coming to Moshe saying, you should know, mark this day on your calendar. Rosh Chodesh Nisan, you will put up the Mishkan. But that's not true, which seeming to imply is the first time you're putting it up. But that's not the case. Moshe Rabbeinu had to put it up for seven days already. So what's the novelty? Today you should put it up. So Ramban says, the novelty of the seventh, of, of the eighth day, when Hashem says on this day you should put it up, meaning this day you're putting it up permanently. The other days you're putting it up in a temporary way. When you're putting it up, you know that you're going to take it out in 12 hours. Something like that. But this time, you're putting it up, and it's going to stay. Not forever, because the Mishkan was a mobile home. And whenever they moved, they had to disassemble it and put it back together again, so on and so forth. But it was, and, but they never knew when they are moving, so when they put it up, they put it up like as if it was going to last forever. So when is that going to happen on the first day? That's Ramban. Ramban actually uses the words. He says, this time you're putting this up. Uh, where is it over here? Bachoydesh. Um... That this time when he put it up, Shuhukam ha Mishkan Lamoid came. The Mishkan was now, this time it was put it on, up for Lamida, for it to stay. The other times it was put up, but not to stay. This time it was put up, hold on one second. Um, oh, the Ramban says it over here. I knew it's over here. Al Shuhu Yay Mashmin Lamim Tama Kosesh Takum Esa Mishkan Viyamoid came. This time you should put up the Mishkan that it should stay. You shouldn't take it down. Um, now, the Ramban is wondering, how come we don't find anywhere in the Torah explicitly Hashem instruct, instructing Moshe Rabbeinu about putting it up and taking it down the seven days? It doesn't say anywhere in the Torah. Those seven day Meluyim practice it says what you should do those seven days regarding sacrifices. Our own son, sprinkling blood, whole procedure, breads, a, a whole situation that was going on. That's discussed. But it doesn't say anywhere to put, put up the Mishkan, take it down, put up the Mishkan. All that is not discussed. Ramban says, why doesn't the Torah mention that? Ramban says it doesn't have to be mentioned. Why? Because it says already in Pasha's Truma that you should put up the Mishkan like you were shown on the mountain. So Ramban says, when the, eight, when the Torah refers to back then, that when it says you should put up the Mishkan like you were shown on the mountain, on the mountain, 
Moshe was instructed for those seven days to put them up, take them down. That's how Hashem showed it to him on the mountain. Seven days. What's the novelty of this Pasuk? That Hashem speaks now to Moshe and he tells him on the eighth day, this is an addition. We've done that drill. Seven days put him up and seven days put him down. In which you've already fulfilled that which it says, you should erect the Mishkan like you were shown on the mountain. That was those seven days. Now, there's another tzivoy. This time, what's special? You're going to put the Mishkan up and it's going to last. That is Ramban's pirush. Rashi, however, Rashi, however, does not learn that way. Rashi learns, which, is, which will give us an understanding now of the whole thing. Rashi learns that the seventh day that they put up the Mishkan um, was never a commandment to Moshe. Moshe never received a specific commandment to put up and take down the Mishkan. Moshe did it on his own. It was not a commandment by God. How did Moshe do, know to do it? Well, obviously, if Hashem gave him a whole regimen of certain sacrifices that need to be brought during those seven days in order to make Aaron holy, so where is he going to do the sacrifices? Just playing in the, in the middle of the desert in an empty land. So Moshe, and, and, and the purpose of those seven days, it was to inaugurate the high priest, Aaron, and the priests, and the Kohanim, to the Avodah. So where do you inaugurate them? In the place and where they're going to be officiating. So from that, Moshe derived that there has to be a Mishkan. From that, Moshe derived that there has to be a Mishkan. Also from this that it says that Aaron is supposed to live seven days, Pesach Oel Moed. Those seven days, Aaron and his sons were supposed to be Pesach Oel Moed by the entrance of the Oel Moed of the Tent of Meeting. If Aaron needs to live by the opening and the entrance of the Oel Moed, of course, there needs to be an Oel Moed. So according to Rashi, it's not just technical. Did Moshe hear it directly or Moshe didn't hear it directly? But rather, it's deeper than that. According to Rashi, there is no intrinsic mitzvah of putting up the Mishkan for seven days. But there is a commandment. But the commandment is not to put up a Mishkan. The commandment is to do other mitzvahs. Technically, to do those mitzvahs, you need a Mishkan. So comes out Moshe's commandment to put up the Mishkan those seven days were part of other commandments. It's not putting up the Mishkan. In reality, according to Rashi and according to the Ramban, Moshe did the same thing. He put up the Mishkan seven days, put him up and put him down. That's not an argument. He did it. The question is, what's the content of that putting up for the seven days? According to the Ramban, it's putting up a Mishkan. When you're putting up a Mishkan, this is the way you do it. Seven days you put it up and take it down, and the eighth day, it's permanent. That's the way you put up a Mishkan. According to Rashi, no, you only put up the Mishkan one day, and that's the eighth day. Seven days, you technically need these walls, and you need this situation, this environment, to be able to do other things that you were commanded to do that day, but that doesn't have the, 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 the content of making the Mishkan. It's not HaKamas HaMishkan. You don't fulfill the mitzvah of the Asili Migdash, make for me a Beis HaMigdash, V'shachanti B'Soycham, and I will dwell there. It's not a Migdash yet. You're not just fulfilling that. That's going to happen on Chodesh Nisan. Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu, this is the day. So according to Rashi, when Hashem commanded Moshe, you should put up the Mishkan like I will show you in the mountain, it wasn't referring to the seven days. It was referring to the eighth day, which Moshe would put up a Mishkan. Seven days before that, it's a byproduct of other mitzvahs, but it's not a mitzvah of Mishkan. According to Ramban, it is a mitzvah of Mishkan. It's one long mitzvah of Mishkan that spans an eight-day period. Seven days, putting it up, take it down, and the eighth. According to that, comes out something. According to that, comes out a very interesting idea. That will change the definition of the service in the temple on the eighth day. 
In other words, depending on how we see the putting up of the Mishkan during, depending on how we see the content of those seven day period before the eighth day, that will define the nature of the work on the eighth day. According to Nachman, we know in a general rule, every avoda, every service, every holy thing requires a, a period called chinuch. Chinuch means either education or inauguration. Now for a person we do education. And for an object or an entity we do inauguration. But, inaugur but really, even education is a form of inauguration. You're inaugurating the child into something. Everything that's holy needs a certain... You can't just boom like that. It needs to be broken in. You need to break it into. So, according to Ramban, since the seven days of Meluyim, we're already fulfilling the mitzvah of the Asuli Migdash, so therefore, during those seven days, qualify that you can start doing already chinuch. Where do you do the chinuch? You can only do the chinuch, the inauguration, if you have a mishkan. Since Ramban holds that we had a mishkan already from the, from the 23rd day of Adar, these last seven days, the mishkan is already put up as a mishkan. If it's a mishkan, you can begin inaugurating. According to the Ramban then, the eighth day, was no more inauguration. Inauguration time is over. We're done. What's the eighth day? We are open for business as usual. Regular day operations. I'm sure it's, oh, it was an exciting day. It's the first day that our own is, but it's regular open for business. It's not the first, the first week celebration sale that a store has. Come and you have free, free, free popcorn. Okay. Free hot dogs for one week in the restaurant. Everybody can come. That's inauguration. According to Ramban, the eighth day, no, no more inauguration. It's a regular day. Why? Because we had inauguration already. The seven days when we were inaugurating our own, those seven days when they were inaugurating our own and his sons, were also inauguration for the Mishka. But Rashi, following Rashi that says that the seven days was not considered halachically making a mishkan. It was only a technical um, mitzvah as part of another mitzvah. But it's not, it doesn't have the quality, the content of making a mishkan. According to that, when it came the eighth day, and this is the first day you have a mishkan. What do you do when you have a mishkan? You need to inaugurate. So according to Rashi, which was the day of inaugurating, of breaking in the Mishkan? Which was that special day of inaugurating the Mishkan? The eighth day. One day of inauguration, and that was the eighth day. And this will already take care. Now we'll understand why Rashi holds that on that day, Moshe Rabbeinu was able to offer sacrifices without the walls, without the fence, and the regular rules don't apply. The reason why the regular rules don't apply, because inaugurations are special. Just like I said earlier, free popcorn. Right? Come in and you get buy one, get one free. It applies when down regular day for business, it doesn't apply. But on the first day, special rules apply. There's different, because it's inauguration. Everybody knows this day is special. It, it works differently. Ramban, who according to him, the eighth day, is a regular business day in the Mishkan. It's no different than any other day following it. According to him, you have to follow the rules and the regulations on the first day as well, on the eighth day, which is the first day of regular business. So he's wondering, and he says, how in the world are Moshe Rabbeinu going to offer a, a carbon oila, a carbon mincha, when the Mizbeach has to be in the courtyard? There ain't no courtyard, there ain't no Mizbeach. That's the halach. But it's not a question on Rashi. Rashi had no problem with that. Because according to Rashi, the, the, mishk, the, the, the first day of business was not the first day of business. It was inauguration day. Inauguration day has different rules. You can get away with all kinds of stuff that you can't do any other time. It's inauguration. It's a carnival today. A special day. That's why we'll answer many questions. 
That's why it's so different this day. This will explain why, you know, lechem upon him, show bread. When did we put the lechem upon him in the base of Middash all the time? Does anybody know when did we put the show bread? On Shabbos. When was the first day of Nisan? Anybody know which day of the week was the first day of Nisan that year? Rashi says it was on a Sunday. Rashi brings from the Medrash, it was on a Sunday. The first, first day of the Mishkan was a Sunday. Grand opening on Saturday, where the minna comes, always to make grand openings on Sunday maybe, right? Sunday was the opening of the Mishkan. Um, so why are you doing showbread? Lechem upon him on a Sunday? Doesn't work. You're supposed to do lechem. I guess technically they couldn't do it on Shabbat. They're going to wait till next week. I know, but how do you do it? Another one. It says over here that um, that Moshe Rabbeinu puts the does all the services, and finally after that he puts the kiar and he puts their water. After everything, after he put the mizbeach, everything, then he put the wash basin and he puts water. But hold it. That means he didn't do the avoda, washing his hands. And we know that you're not allowed to do, if chas v'shalom, a kohen, anybody that goes to officiate without washing his hands and feet, it's punishable by death. It's a very, very serious violation. And here Moshe Rabbeinu was doing all of that without washing his hands and feet. Because he didn't even put the kiyar yet. But now we understand. According to Rashi, it's not a problem. According to Ramban, it's also not a problem. Because Ramban says... <laughs> Everything was put into place and afterwards, so it could be Moshe washed his hands and feet from the kiyar, and then he went and he did everything. So it's not a question according to Rambam, but according to Rashi, who says he did it immediately, it's not a question. All the things were done exactly as it's listed. That means he did the work without washing his hands, because today is an extraordinary day. It's not a regular day, and today you can do things differently. And why are you able to do things differently? Because it's inauguration day. It's a day of chinuch. To understand this a little deeper, we'll un we'll, 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 um, to understand this a little deeper, let's analyze one more thing. There's something else that was done over here. The way the Mishkan was put up on the eighth day is um, really questionable. What's the question? Earlier in the in the in the parsha, right in the beginning, Rashi says that Moshe and Bitzalel had a little argument. Betzalel is the one who was, it was his project. He built the Mishkan. But Moshe was the commander-in-chief. Moshe, when he instructed Betzalel to do the work, Moshe told him, instructions, you'll make the Aron, and then you'll make the Shulchan, which is make the Ark, and then make the, ta the table, and then make the menorah, and the candelabra. And then Moshe instructed him on making him the, and then making the, 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 the structure itself, the Mishkan itself, the walls, the beams, the roof, all that. B'tzalel says to Moshe Rabbeinu, well, I don't really get it. B'tzalel says, The minhag of the world is not to do that. The minhag of the world is not to do this, something like this. You don't you don't build furniture and then build a house for the furniture. First you build a house. And after you build a house, you furnish the house. So B'tzalel objected to Moshe. Moshe Rabbeinu was saying, well, make the furniture first and then build a house. And B'tzalel says to Moshe, the world, the way things are done, they're done differently. Moshe Rabbeinu says to Bitzalel, hear this, you're right. And that's why you're called Bitzalel. Because that's the way I heard it from God. God actually said like you, make the house and then make the, the, uh, make the house itself and then you'll make the furniture. And that's the meaning of the word, Shkoyach. Bitzal Kel Hayisa. Bitzal, bitzal Kel means Bitzal Kel. In the shadow of God, you were sitting. You must have been eavesdropping on my lesson with Hashem because you know the way God told me. I switched the order, for whatever reason Moshe switched the order, but you heard the way Hashem said, and you're right, do it your way. So 
So good. It's been settled. How was it settled? What was the settlement? They argued, and now they came to a, a conclusion. What was the conclusion? We're going to do it Betzalel's way. What's the Betzalel's way? First the building, and then furniture. If that's the case, we get to a problem, the same problem right now. What does it say? Moshe Rabbeinu, um, he puts up the Mishkan, but he doesn't put the partition. So he has an open Kodesh HaKadoshim. He has a holy of holies that's completely open. In that holy of holies that is incomplete because it doesn't have a partition, he brings in the Aron and he places it there. Then he goes into the outer room and he doesn't yet have the second partition. The outer room, the Oel Moed, also had a partition. Because it says later, after he, and he brings in the three utensils that go, the three furniture items, he moves in the Shulchan, the Menorah, the Mizbeach, these three items. And then he puts the partition. Then he goes to the altar, and, the mizbe- and, and, by, and by the altar, the outer altar, it's even the most, it seems the strongest. Not only isn't there a partition, there isn't even a courtyard, as we mentioned earlier. Moshe puts the Mizbeach, and then he builds the courtyard. So in addition to the question we had earlier, how is he offering sacrifices? That was one question we had earlier. There's another question. We already established that first you build the structure and then you move the furniture into the house. How is it that Moshe Rabbeinu kind of is going back to his, to his way and putting in the furniture before the house was completed? In the two rooms, he hasn't... A house without, without a wall, without a doorway, is not much of a house. A house needs a doorway. It's incomplete. Especially the altar, the outer altar, the Mizbech, doesn't have a courtyard. So he didn't finish the structure and he's putting in the furniture. It's the opposite of the order that the way it should be. Obviously the answer is going to be that uh, all this that the Torah is telling us, this part of the story all those rules and, and, and regulations is when we're talking about Mishkan, when Mishkan is Mishkan. Now we're not talking about Mishkan as Mishkan being Mishkan. We're talking about inaugurating Mishkan. The inauguration of the Mishkan, going back to what we said earlier, has special rules. So you're right. Once the Mishkan is in business in u- as usual mode, and you, you see this, let me show you. By the way, look. how about all the other times when they assembled and disassembled? All the other times when they assembled and disassembled Mishkan. Um, in, the, in, the, in the Midbar, they kept on moving. As I said earlier, the Mishkan was a mobile home. So every time they moved, how did they do it? Betzalel's way or Moshe's way? Did they put the, the furniture in first or did they put the Mishkan in first? So if you remember... A part of the Torah we didn't learn yet this year, but we're going to learn it in Bamidbar. There were three groups, families of Levim. The Levites had three families. Um, one family, um, the Kahas family, they carried the utensils, the furniture. The other two families, Gershon and Merari, carried all the, all the building materials of the Mishkan itself. The walls, the, 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 the curtains on the top and all of that. So the Torah says the way they traveled was that Gershon and Merari went ahead and Kahas stayed by, behind. And the reason was so that by the time Kahas would arrive by the place where they were going to camp and put up the Mishkan, the Gershon and, and Merari were so efficient, they got the entire Mishkan built up, chick chak and by the time these, this group came, they were able to enter all the vessels into a mishkan that was fully, fully erect, fully set up. You see clearly that the way you set up a mishkan, when mishkan needs to be in full-fledged, regular service, it has to be like Petzalel said. First the house, and then you put furniture. Why is it in this case, over here, it's different? So going back to what we said before, it has special rules 
this whole process that Moshe was doing now, including all of his officiations that he was officiating right now, was not part of the business as usual element of the Mishkan. By the way, the eighth day also had business as usual. Even according to Rashi, it also had regular. That's once Aaron stepped in. After Moshe finished, Moshe stepped aside, Aaron stepped in. That was the first day of regular business in the Beis Amigdash. True. But this project that we're learning about over here, and that's going to be discussed in Parsha Shmini. Vayibayom Shmini, it's going to tell you what Aaron did later in Vayikra. This Parsha in Pikude is not talking about the first day of business as usual. It's talking about the first day the Mishkan was put up, but it's the inaugurational ceremonies. And inaugurational ceremonies have its own rules. And to that, as we said earlier, you know, um, you, can, you can offer sacrifices without walls. You can serve without washing your hands. Uh, you can put furniture before you put uh, 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 the thing, before you put the walls. It has special rules. Okay, so we're going to kind of get away with it according to Rashi. However, the question is still going to be as follows. Even if it works, but why does it dafka have to be this way? It's like, okay, for inauguration, you can kind of, you don't have to be so strict. But why did they have to do it this way? Why couldn't Moshe Rabbeinu just follow the regular system of setting up the Mishkan, and then he'll do, he'll do whatever he needs to do? Why did Moshe Rabbeinu dafka precisely, again, according to Rashi, offer sacrifice in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a fenceless courtyard, where there is no courtyard, there is no fence. Why did he do it dafka that way? Why couldn't he do it in the appropriate way? It'll be better. Inauguration is different, but why? What's the deeper reason? So here there's something very, very special. And this is going to be a very powerful lesson for us. And that is as follows. Even though Moshe Rabbeinu was putting up a temporary mishkan, this was a mobile home. But this was already the beginning of the fulfillment of the ultimate mitzvah. What's the ultimate, ultimate mitzvah? To build a home for God in this world. That's the ultimate mitzvah. And when does it reach its fullest realization? Not in the mobile home. A house for Hashem has to be a home, not a tent. So when is the real the Asuli Migdash going to be fulfilled when we have a Beis HaMikdash. So Shlom HaMelech, when he built the Beis HaMikdash, that's when the Asuli Migdash really realized, we really, the Jewish people really realized and fulfilled the commandment. And Shlom HaMelech's temple did not last forever. Second temple built by Ezra, and eventually the real, real temple of God and the ultimate, ultimate temple that's going to be an eternal temple forever and ever is going to be the Beis HaMikdash HaShlishi. And that's when Hashem is finally going to have a home in this world as He desired. So even though Moshe Rabbeinu's making of the Mishkan was just like an introductory state, but it already was the seed for the future Beis HaMikdashes. Based on that, what we're going to say now is not what I'm saying, it's the Lubavitch Rebbe says this in the talk, very interesting. He says when Moshe Rabbeinu inaugurated the Mishkan, that act of inauguration was not inaugurating a Mishkan. It was inaugurating all the Beis HaMikdashes. He inaugurated Mikdash, the concept, the Asuli Mikdash. The Mikdash was inaugurated by Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu's inauguration of the, of, the, of the Mishkan was the inauguration, the Pneumius, internally. In essence, it was the inauguration of the follow-up after the Mishkan, the Mishkan Shiloh, the Shiloh tent. It was because that too was a continuum of the Asali Migdash. It was the inauguration of King Solomon's building, structure, palace that he made for Hashem, the Beis HaMikdash. It was the inauguration of Bayashani, the second temple. And it is, Bipnimius, and internal, even though we don't see it, the inauguration of the third temple. And it's all coming from the power of Moshe Rabbeinu. 
doesn't say it explicitly, but we understand why. Because Moshe Rabbeinu is the man who connects heaven and earth. He is that super neshama that can make that connection. And that's why his work is burrowing through all of history. And his inauguration is already the super inauguration for the super temple as well. All the way through time. So now we'll understand why Moshe Rabbeinu on purpose inaugurated the base on Migdash and did certain things when there were no walls around it. And the reason is because the Rambam Halacha, the Rambam Maimonides teaches a very fundamental law regarding the base on Migdash. Makrivin karbonois afal pi she'ein shom bias. We can offer karbono sacrifices even though there is no base amigdash. That means technically today's days, we can offer karbonos in the base amigdash on the Temple Mount. You have technical problems. Technical problem is that we're tame and we're impure and we can't go there and all these other things. And we also have technical problem, problems because we have three billion Muslims in the world that may, might be so happy about the situation. If, but in, in, in concept, halachically, we are allowed to offer karbonites in that place, even though once the Beis Amigdash was built, it is forbidden to offer karbonos anywhere but in the Beis Amigdash. But there's no Beis Amigdash. How does the Rambam say that today's days we're allowed to offer? And even though there's no Hazar, the Rambam says even though the, the walls of the Azara are broken down, there are no walls, there is no Azara, there is no courtyard walls, we can still offer Karbanais today over there. Rambam says because the holiness that Shlomo HaMelech sanctified, the Makayim HaMikdash, the place of the Beis HaMikdash, its holiness is eternal. It's not like Eretz Yisrael. The holiness of Eretz Yisrael was a holiness that was interrupted. The first initial holiness. When we went into Eretz Yisrael and we conquered the land, that holiness, was the Rambam says, is related to a conquest. We conquered it, that's what made it holy. As soon as we lost the conquest, because we were driven out of Eretz Yisrael, the holiness went. We lost the holiness. Initially, the first, the first time the Jewish people. Then he says we came back the second time, and this time we possessed Eretz Yisrael in a way of possession, not through conquest. So therefore the second possession, the holiness of Eretz Yisrael today, is because of the Kedusha of Ezra, not because of the Kedusha of Yeshua bin Nun when we went in the first time. Because that was, that was destructive. But the Ramam says that's the holiness of Eretz Yisrael. But the holiness of the Beis Amigdash and of Yerushalayim, the Rambam says its Kedusha is not because of our conquest. Its holiness is because of the Shechina. And Shechina Enoi Betelo, the Shechina is forever. The holiness of Yerushalayim and the Holy Temple is because God dwells over there. It's Hashem's place. We discussed it last year, actually, Parshas Pekudei as well. We spoke about this Parshas, about this concept. But the holiness of the Beis Amish because of the Shechina, Shechina ain't a betela, Shechina is forever. Like we know the Kosal Hamaravi is a holy place because the Shechina is over there. So what do we see from here? Even if there's no structure, there's no Beis Amigdash, its holiness is permanent. However, here clearly, that holiness is not in the Migdash. It's not in the Beis Amigdash. That holiness is in the place of the Beis Amigdash. What are we saying? That when, why is Yerushalayim holy? Why is the real estate? Why is the Temple Mount holy? The real estate, the Temple Mount, the Beit Samigdosh, it's Kadosh, it's holy, because, the, because Hashem dwells there, and no one can chase God away, and therefore it's forever. So the place is holy, not the structure. Once the structure is destroyed, it's not holy, right? But the the, the, the Chiddush the Lubavitcher Rebbe wants to say, the Rebbe wants to say, this is his Chiddush, that in, a, in addition to the holiness of the place, there is also an eternal holiness in the Beis Hamikdash itself, even though it was destroyed. And the reason is, not coming from Shlomo Melech, coming from Moshe Rabbeinu. 
since Moshe Rabbeinu was the first one to make a mish, make a migdash, what was Moshe Rabbeinu's migdash? The mishkan. That's the first. The mishkan is the first. Is the first base on migdash? Who made it, Moshe Rabbeinu? Moshe Rabbeinu instilled in the Mishkan an eternal holiness that doesn't end. In order to express that, and that's why later when the base of Mikdash is built, it's also eternally holy. So it's not only Makhoi Mikdash, it's Mikdash itself, the base of Mikdash itself is eternally holy. How did Moshe Rabbeinu reveal that and show that? Very simple. What did he do by the inauguration the first day? He offered sacrifices when there is no walls. That was reminiscent and that was reflecting that we can offer sacrifices in the base of Mikdash even though there are no walls. There's no need any walls. The, 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 the Mikdash is holy. And karbonais are, you're able to offer karbonais even if there's no mechitzes. Why? Since the halacha is by the Beis HaMikdash. That today we can offer karbonais even when the walls are taken down. So that, so, and why is that? In addition to the holiness of the place, it's the holiness of the Beis HaMikdash that even when it's broken, it's still holy. That was established for Moshe Rabbeinu when Moshe Rabbeinu built the Mishkan. That's why Moshe Rabbeinu intentionally inaugurated the Mishkan for it to be holy even when there are no walls. So his first act of inauguration was an altar, there are no walls, and he offered karbanis. That established that a, a Beis HaMikdash without walls can also be because Moshe Rabbeinu did it that way. First of all, it's a tremendous chidush, it's a tremendous novelty. That the Maise Chinuch of Moshe Rabbeinu, the act of Chinuch of Moshe Rabbeinu, wasn't just for the Mishkan. It, 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 was, a, it was an act of Chinuch for all the Batim English, even the Beis HaMikdash Hashlishi. That's a big Chiddush, that's a big novelty. But the fact that, and that it's going to be an uninterrupted holiness, and no one can break it, and even when the walls come down, it's still holy. Now, now we'll understand why, the, also the reason why Moshe Rabbeinu intentionally put furniture in first, before he put the walls up. Going back to the conversation that Moshe had with Betzalel, when Moshe said, make the furniture first, what was Betzalel's response? Betzalel's response was, it is the minig of the world. The minig of the world. People don't do this. So you ask me a question. What do you mean, who cares what people do? We're building a mishkan. Who cares what people do? It's like, you know, what are you, you're like, oh, you know, the Rosenbergs around the corner, when they built their house, they... You're talking to Moshe. Moshe Ben is talking to you about building a house for God. So you're telling me that the Rosenbergs around the corner, when they did it, and the Finkelsteins... You know, who, who live on, on, on Formosa, they also did it like this? Man, who, who's talking about? What do you mean? This is the minig of the world. God is telling you to build me a mishka. The answer is, Hashem is moving into our world, no? He's got he's to follow the building code of the Los Angeles district, right? They make you more sugar, right? The government makes you crazy with the building code. If God is moving into this world, he's got to play by the rules of this world. That's it. There's my Shabbat. You, you, you want to do your own thing, God? Then you got to do it somewhere else. Over here, there are rules. The waste people, yeah, yeah. The Abraster's moving in. He's got to accommodate himself to the rules of this world. So that's why Betzalel is right. Benoyak Shabbat. But there's only one problem. If you're going to build this house, Benoyak Shabbat, the way people do it, People's homes that were built in 1643, you don't really find around that much. Or people's homes that were built in 1125 are not really standing today. Why? Because human structures that are done by finite human beings collapse. They last for a while and they're gone. 
So the problem over here, however, is that what? We are now building a home for God that is going to last for what? For all eternity. You're right. Now it's a mobile home. Then it's going to be a temple. And then it's going to be another temple. But eventually, we're inaugurating now a house forever and ever. What do we mean forever and ever? A thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand, a million, ten million, a billion. Forever. As long as this world is going to be. Which, he, which can go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Because, that's, because Hashem is going to dwell in that house. That's forever. Well, that kind of a structure, you can't build the way Rosenbergs do it. And the way the Finkelsteins do it. That kind of a structure has got to be built the way God wants it. So even though Betzalel is right, that since God is moving into this world, he's got to work, he's got to play by the rules that happen down here. Hashem does, however, have to leave over a couple of shtiklach, a couple of little pieces that he doesn't run benoak shabol on the way people do things. He does it the way God does things. And you do it the way God does. So you're inserting the infinite. You're inserting something transcendental. You're bringing into the world a power that's beyond creation. And that's why Moshe Rabbeinu says like this. Bitzalel, I get you. You're all right. You're going to do it your way. You're going to build it the way people build it on the block. The way that building code says, Gizuntahe, do your thing. But on the day of the inauguration, please step aside. Let me do my thing. Why? Because now Moshe Rabbeinu has to turn this base on English into a, in, 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 into a building of eternity. And in that sense, you don't go b'min ha'ga'olam, the minig of the world. Minig of the world is great. But right now, you got to transcend the world. And in the transcendental world of Moshe Rabbeinu, you can have furniture even though you don't have a building. As a matter of fact, the moment you can put the furniture, you put the furniture. You, more than that, you can offer karbonos even though there are no walls and there are no... There's no no ikshaba olam. There's no... In the worldly, what is right, what the custom of the world is, yes, you have furniture only when the house is finished and completed and so on and so forth. But when you're dealing with an infinite power and an infinite dimension and an eternal thing, then uh, things don't necessarily always work. So again, it does not, we're not dismissing the Noach Sheba Olam, the, the conduct of the world, because we do have to conduct ourselves with the conduct of the world. But even when we're told to conduct ourselves with the conduct of the world, if you're in a relationship with God, there has to be a few exits where you're not so stuck in the world situation, but you have a certain transcendence that's beyond. That's beyond. Therefore, the Rebbe says an amazing thing. He says the Hayra, the teaching for this for our generation. He says, even though in general a Jew is supposed to serve Hashem in a very orderly organized fashion. And the orderly organized fashion recommends and says that first you have to create a general structure. And after you create the general structure, you can start thinking about the details. But you can't start immediately with details because you're going to overload. So you still first start with general structure. And then you get to specifics. For example, if you want to start being more, it's, you'll be Makar of a Judah Yiddishkeit. Don't get caught with a detail, with a little part. Give the person the general ideas of being Jewish. Slowly but surely, you're going to work your way to details and so on and so forth. And with yourself educating yourself or educating your children, there is a certain structure, you follow a certain pattern of what makes sense, and that's how you build. The Rebbe says, that's good for regular, for regular times. But there are times, for example, he says, in the emergency times that we're living in right now, which is called Ikvasa the Mashiach, the last moments before Mashiach comes. We are living in such wild times. We're living in such extraordinary moments where you can conduct yourself in the conduct of the world. That today's days, any type of opportunity you have to do something good, even though you can argue to yourself or others might tell you, well, you, is this the only thing? You're, are you really ready for this? You have nothing else in your life that you have to take care of? It's always that way. You have nothing else in your life that you need to take care of and you have to get involved with this and this little detail? And the answer is, if times are times as usual, you're right. 
But when we're dealing in a specific emergency time, every single thing you grab, you have an opportunity to do something, do it. Do it immediately. If it's a chumrah, if it's a thing that is beyond your regular, do it anyways. Today's day, why? Because we don't know the last specs, the last tiny things that need to be done. We can't approach it all so systematic. There has to, in other words, what the Rebbe is really saying is that we have to be on fire. In other words, we have to be out of control. Follow? You have to be out of control, in control. Can't be out of control and be a bulldozer and destroy. But inside, you have to be a fire. You have to be a blaze. You're doing things that are beyond order, beyond normal. No. You have to respect Betzalel's reality, that you have to conduct yourself. But if anybody probes a little deeper, you see you're dealing with an energy. You're dealing with a power. You're dealing with a force. That's, that, 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 that's beyond normal. It's not normal. And therefore, it doesn't follow all the systematic systems of first, let's work on the bigger things, and then we'll get to the smaller things. No, whatever it is, you learn something, do it. You're not holding by it yet. You didn't get to it. That's for another time. Now, now it's time. Why? Because it's time to be Machanach, the third temple. And the Rebbe says it's interesting. Primarily by Chinuch, he says. This is when you're educating a Jewish child. You really need to imbue in them this infinite energy, devotion, dedication that transcends norms and systems. And systems. Today's days I find, and this is I think the Rebbe could be alluding to, we're turning a lot towards secular help to help with education, education. And they're very good. Some of these things are really methods and good ways in which you say the old yeshiva school system did not really pay attention. And today's days we have to, we have these uh, modern day interventions and we need to in intervene. And I agree with that 100%. You know, the way it was when I was a kid in Cheder, you got two pets from the Rebbe and you, and you basically know what you need to do. The rest of the day or the rest, depends, each kid. Some kid needed a patch every morning and then he behaved. The other guy needed one patch once a week. The other guy needed once a month. But everybody kind of, that's the way it was. And obviously that's ain't going to work on our children. It's ain't going to work in the whole lifestyle of the Jew. It's uh, not going to work. So we have to take on all the systems that there are for modern psychology and work and teach and so on and so forth. Problem is that what I am finding is that it's coming at the cost of that transcendental energy and fire of the soul. You can't lose that. You gotta have both together. And also you have to follow the order and we have all these systems, but the systems are good for Gentile kids. You're dealing with a Jew who's got an infinite power and a power to turn over the world and, and, a, and an urgency that Moshiach has to come. So if you don't put in that fire, you don't put in that, that, that power that transcends all, all, normal, all normal things, just that energy, which he knows, that at all costs, no matter how crazy it is, even if we don't eat lunch right now because we need to get this done and it's going to end up costing, other, we're going to end up eating at 4 o'clock and you'll be a little hungry, but you know what? We're doing this mitzvah, we're doing this great thing, we're up till 3 in the morning because we need to get this thing done, we need to finish this project. I'm talking about those kind of things. Ah, it's normal, you got to be at your bedtime, 8 o'clock at night, it's true. But you know what? You know what we're living right now? So when we need to get a certain project done, a certain thing needs to get done, is there's that uncontrollable energy. There's that power. And the Rebbe says, you know what's going to come out if you're machanach children like that? If you give them that beyond, in other words, you're working within the system of the world, but you also release into them and you ignite in them that Moshe Rabbeinu energy that's infinite, that transcended, that doesn't work with all these calculations. It's just a boundless devotion to the Abishter's will. You know what's going to happen? Amazing thing is going to happen. When this child is going to find he, 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 when this child is going to find himself later in life, him or her, in an environment where there are no walls. Hear the depth of this. Where there are no holy walls. In other words, they will find themselves outside of the realms of holiness. They will find themselves surrounded by unholiness, things that are antithetical to being Jewish. They're not in the base of Mikdash. You know what this child is going to do? He's still going to be able to be makriv a karban. You know what that means? The child is still going to be able to... What are we talking about? What was the whole concept? The whole concept is if you do it this way, you can be makriv a karban even if there's no walls. 
What does that mean spiritually? It means with this kind of a chinuch, a child that is going to be in an environment where he does not have holy walls, that means he's not in an enclosed yeshiva school. For whatever reason, he finds himself in a place where there's all kinds of tests and all kinds of temptations. And he's not, and there's no one looking, and he's alone, and he's outside. He's still going to offer sacrifices. He or she, meaning they're still going to be willing to subdue their animalistic desire for God's, for God's sake. Offering a sacrifice, meaning offering your animal soul. They're going to be makriv a korban, even if it's not in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment. You know, it's very easy when you're in yeshiva, when you're in, when you're in, when you're in shul, when you're amongst your fellows. But what's going to be when you're on vacation? What's going to be when business takes him to a place where there's no one seeing and there's no one there? Is he still going to offer his animal soul? More than that. But what else can you do? What else can you do? What else do we say you can do when there is no walls? You can eat karbonis when there is no walls. Eat kachim, eat karbonis. And what does that mean? Eat kodesh, holy. Rebbe says it means something very deep. It means that holiness and godliness is something that will be eaten by this child even when they're not in an holy environment. You know what that means? That means that they will be internalized. Eating means when you internalize something and it becomes part of you. And so it's one thing to say, you know, when I'm living in a very, very, very well insular community, I'm trained, me, my children, my family, we're trained to do what? To have our daily dose of Torah study, our daily inspiration. We can absorb and internalize holiness. That means eating sacrifices, eating holiness. But when there are no walls, there are no walls. When we're living, when we end up in our lives in a place where it's a cold desert, it's desolate, it's empty, it's dark. Number one, can you make a sacrifice, a godly sacrifice? In that state, can you connect to holiness so deeply that you're eating it, and you're absorbing it, and you're internalizing it, even when there are no walls? Well, it depends on what kind of chinuch you got. That's the thing. If the chinuch that the child got was a chinuch of Moshe Rabbeinu, if the chinuch, the education that the child got, had an element of transcendental energy to it, had an element of craziness, I'm just putting it down in simple words, had an element of radical craziness, good radical craziness. That means that you don't have to completely be systemized and work with the norm. There's no question that the norm is a norm and we're human beings and we have to follow certain routines and certain regulatory things. But there always has to be an infusion of that fiery energy that knows no limit and knows no boundaries in its holiness. That will assure Children that can eat karbanis and offer, and, and, and offer sacrifices even when there are no walls around them of protected Kedusha. And this is the lesson from this, from the way Rashi understands Moshe Rabbeinu is putting up of the Mishkan. May we merit already to see the power of Moshe Rabbeinu's inauguration as the third base Amigdash unfolds in front of our eyes so, so soon, we can't even imagine how soon it will be. And when we will see that eternal edifice of Hashem finally fully built, fully manifest in our reality, may we get to see it through Mashiach Tzedkenu. May we see it 